message at the top that says um, we're recording um, and be sure to let everybody know that we're doing it. And there is a po privacy policy that um, that Brock has agreed to with Microsoft on the terms of, of agreement. So that's uh, happening right now and that's how it happens. And then you, we will all get a little notification in the chat once the recording is done. Um, and as the owner, I can go and do lots of things with it, which in this case, I will be downloading it and putting it in the YouTube so it can be available for everybody. So by default, a recording is only available to the people who are in that meeting or classroom. Um, before I get too uh, uh, far along, I just want to um, introduce my great colleagues who are here today. I have Alisa who will be monitoring the chat. So if you have some questions, you can put them in the chat and she will do her best to uh, do split attention and uh, and make sure that we're kind of answering your questions in addition to going through the presentation. Um, and um, I will note that there are people popping into the guest and as as the lobby and you should all get little notifications of that and that's those are people who haven't logged into the team's interface or office 365 interface which means that they might have limited um, ability to do certain things like they probably can't record um, and sometimes depending on the browser they can't even chat so we definitely recommend that you log in and you use either the app or a chrome browser if you're going to be using teams um, uh, Mike is uh, lurking, so I won't um, have him introduce himself, but we do have some uh, background tech support somewhere. Um, okay, so last week, um, this is one of many sessions that we've been um, offering, and I just wanted to show you that there, these are all being housed. We're putting all the resources, all the extra links, all the materials, and the recordings when they are created. Up, up on this uh, special interest and workshop site. Um, so that's where this material will go in addition to all the other resources um, that we reference. So um, please don't feel like, you know, if it's too much uh, that you can't get it, you'll be able to go back to it and at any time. Um, and that is part of the feedback that we've received, um, which also I will say right now, I was told that it was helpful to have the PowerPoint slides right from the outset, so I'm going to share them in the chat right now for you. So that gives you access to view the PowerPoint slides when I post them on the website uh, because it's a web, uh, it, it's, be it's better to have it as a PDF, so it'll be a PDF for you. But now you have access to both because you're special because you came today. So for those of you who came to session one, we did a vote, as you may remember. Um, just by a show of hands, how many of you were at session one? I know that we have some new people. So this, um, for those of you who are new, these are the people who decided how this session was going to go. Um, so I said, choose your top three um, items. And so um, thank you. Now you can, yes, take your hand down so that I'll know if you really do have a question. So those are that's an Kushner. example is now joining that is also a setting that you can change in the meeting options that i forgot to do where you can turn off that ability um, i'll just remind all new people joining if you could mute your microphones unless you have to speak that would be awesome so last week we chose the top three um, you will see that online exam proctoring was number one um, and then but i had already given a caveat of that is actually a tricky topic um, but I still want to address it, so I will um, do that next. But the top three things um, were video and audio presentations, frequency, high frequency, low stakes testing, and forum discussion. So that's what we'll be talking about today. And if I didn't uh, create these slides at like three in the morning, I would have sent these out to you and let you know what you'd be getting today. So I apologize, but we are really on a just in time schedule here at CPI. So thanks for your patience. Um, so I want to address remote proctoring. A report has come out. We did do a pilot this spring um, and Proctor Track was the tool that the province has purchased um, on an as needs basis for universities and we ran a pilot with accounting um, and it demonstrated suitability for a narrow application. Uh, it's quite complex. There are privacy concerns that are both experiential and legal uh, and by legal I mean the freedom of information and protection of privacy. Um, it does ask for the student's uh, driver's license. It does do facial recognition. Um, it does uh, 
sometimes ask for a, a knuckle scan. Um, it sometimes asks for a room scan. Um, and also it was not 100% um, there's not 100% confidence that it actually was can prevent cheating. Um, so in the role of supporting programs and courses where this is a requirement for your accreditation, for example, nursing accounting, it maybe has a narrow application, but the mo most broadly viable approach is going to be to, to go with an open book and let's let's work on the students integrity. So that's um, I Please follow up with some emails after if, if that was what you were hoping to learn about today. Um, but we are going to be um, looking at authentic assessment today and ways that we can actually build um, the learning experience in uh, to, to the assessment. So authentic assessment means that we're actively engaging students in their own learning. We're connecting it to real life and we're trying to obviously build on what the students prior learning is and as they develop their knowledge and skills. And we're also trying to provide multiple pathways for, for that to be, for students to ex, uh, express that. And that is a, one of the main um, accessibility principles for universal design for learning. So there's um, a lot of great reasons to design your assessments this way. And so um, I will give you the chance to, if this is not what you're um, hoping to learn about today, um, it was nice to see you and <laughs> you can watch the recording later. <laughs> Thanks Joanne, That's, I appreciate that. Um, so today we're going to talk, the top three votes were audio and video presentations, high frequency, low stakes, multiple choice testing, and forum discussion. So that's what we're going to try and um, get through today. Um, again, I have received a lot of feedback where it felt a little bit like I was giving you fire hose of information and you were <laughs> trying to take it all in. And I'm sorry if that caused any anxiety people to people. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to go through and uh, give you an overview of everything. And then if you um, want to stay and ask some questions, then you're welcome to, but we'll stop the recording at that point. Um, and then uh, we'll open it up for, for more broader discussion. So we're just going to try and make this like a short presentation to go through these three key areas. Um, and then we'll open it up for discussion. OK. So the key thing when you do most assignments is to decide um, the tension between how much do the students need to see the other student work. And so um, in some cases, it, students can really benefit from interacting with other students. I mean, in a lot of cases, we know that's a great learning principle, but it's not for every time. So that's the first thing that you want to decide if you're going to do an audio or video presentation is uh, where where does it need to go? Um, so if it's just between you and the student, then it would go in the assignment tool or and um, and then like the TA could grade it or you could grade it and that's just that's a one way thing and that would probably happen if a, if you expected the assignments to be pretty similar but if you if you really are doing authentic assessment and you're building from students prior experience and they're going to have this wide breadth of um, perspectives and approaches then you could put these in the forums or student pages and the great thing about Sakai now is it supports audio and video in all of these uh, so in the assignment tool in the forums and in student pages and other um, places. So anywhere there's a text box, you can add these things, which is pretty great. So um, I wanted to give you some examples of people who are doing audio um, podcast style assignments. Um, Julie Stevens in sport management has, um, she does the advanced analysis of sport industry and hockey. And these, she actually wrote this up as um, uh, open, as an open assignment so people can uh, replicate and take her instructions and kind of tweak it and it's done as a debate. So this is an example of sharing um, of, of group work. So she has a fairly large class, almost 200 students, but she puts them into groups and they work in groups of five and she has them uh, take a pro and um, against stance on a variety of topics related to, to hockey um, and they have to construct their debate together and they they stitch it together in an audio um, um, session and it, they actually have done some really great stuff. It's pretty impressive. Um, so it's a really creative outlet, but it also gets to all the uh, major learning outcomes of understanding the complexity of the issues. And then it's a different way for people, for the students to hear the variety of different topics and the pros and cons of each of them. Another example of using a podcast is this great idea about um, finding the nuggets. So if you had um, uh, like a, a reading, this is something that could be done through the weeks. Um, where you um, 
I'd have the students find an excerpt and they call it the um, Gardner Campbell does this it's he find you find the section that really find you find really interesting and you actually read it out aloud and then you you embed that into uh, the forums or some other format and you say what you found really um, compelling about that argument it's just a way to engage with the text in a different way um, so that's just another example and these are open syllab um, syllabus examples that I can that I'm sharing with you so that you can reuse them. Um, inside of the text editor, as I was telling you, every um, little button has this record and embed audio. Um, it is worth noting that the audio is not uh, um, transcribed. So if what a good accessibility feature would be for you to have them also write out their script. So if they are submitting that way and they are sharing it with other students just for maximum accessibility, have them uh, provide their script along with it so that students could read uh, the script as, as well as listen. So you're doing this multiple uh, modes of presentation. As for video, we have a lot of um, different ways that video are being done in the class right now. A great example and um, is Havina does this for her uh, Canadian foreign policy. She had always done it um, in class, but a couple years ago her class got uh, to be really large and she didn't have time for every single student or groups groups to present back to class because there was so much content. And so we suggested trying um, using a video presentation. So this is something that she's tried um, while she was still meeting face to face, but it was just another way for students to engage and do um, the poster presentation, but done completely online. So she provided a, a template for them. And then they, uh, this was also a group assignment, but it can be done individually. And they did a, um, a talk uh, over um, uh, and they decided who would do what. And I'll show you later about how you make sure that people are doing what and how you keep track of that. But uh, we helped uh, with writing up the instructions on how that can be done. So this kind of assignment is in the bag. You can tweak it uh, the way that you like. I'm showing you a very specific example for her class, but we have it um, more broadly. Um, and like I was showing you before, every single text box in assignments and in forums um, on student pages has this little embed Echo 360 media. And so um, it's really simple to embed your um, your videos in there. We also have some generic instructions that we're um, linking here so that if the, you don't want to do a poster assignment, it's just sort of you're just going to submit a video presentation. And so we've written these from a student perspective. Um, so you could just take this or link to it and use it in your course. Um, then now this kind of blends into the, the discussion. So a lot of people were interested in forum discussions and these kind of overlap. So you could be using audio and video inside a forum. So um, there's some, these are the, the tips for effective discussions is um, to provide structure. So if you want to ensure um, that they will post every single week, you just need to give very good um, expectations and clarify. Some of the most important things are posing a good question. So that um, question about for um, Julie Stevens podcast, it was framing it as a, you know, a little bit of a debate or is there something, is there a way that you can ask the question that there's not just one answer. So you want to ask a really good question. Um, and then you want to provide opportunity for everybody to be heard. And that uh, is great in forums because you can do group specific um, uh, forum topics. So that doesn't, so that means that either can be by, um, you know, seminars of 20 or you could do smaller groups that people even do groups of five and that have them sign up. So if it's part of the group work. Um, and so this, uh, the showing your presence is where if you have a large class, um, your, your teaching assistants are going to be essential. Um, and so you want to make sure that your teaching assistants are in there or you are in there um, just to make sure that you're, you're keeping things on track. And if it's really sensitive topic, you want to make sure that it's going on track in the right direction. Um, but you don't have to answer to every single post. You'll find that they engage with each other because you, if you've designed the question really well. Um, and that's part of encouraging the, the student ownership. So you want to ensure that you build into the structure of designing the this, this discussion so that people are engaging with each other in a, an authentic way. It's not just, yeah, that's a great point. I agree what you said, um, but there's some kind of, you know, if it, it really is a perspective, somebody is responding with an alternate perspective. And, that's, and that goes back to the monitoring because you do want to make sure that it stays on track. Um, so I want to point out that there are uh, over 360 titles of open textbooks. Now this is more about content, 
um, like your, you know, lecture or your lessons material, but there are also really great examples inside these texts of some, dis of some really good discussion questions. And so you could just jump to the part that, that is the discussion question and be like, oh yeah, that's a good question. So if you're kind of like needs a little bit of, uh, you know, stir up your creativity and think about what some good questions are, please go check out a lot of these open textbooks. There's a lot of um, things that are built in. Some of them have actually interactive elements that maybe you could point to. Um, so you don't have to just be uh, coming up with everything right from scratch yourself. There's a lot of work that people have done who are just like you, teacher scholars who are really interested in student learning um, and really put their um, their research prowess into their, their scholarship of teaching. And they've spent their time designing these open textbooks so that it can make your life easier and also it makes it um, less expensive for students. So um, I, there are some really great titles and I, I recommend you check them out and see what you can see about um, some discussion prompts. I wanted to share some examples of how um, forms are being used uh, right here on campus. So um, these instructors have given me permission to share screenshots of uh, how they're using it. So I, want, I thought it'd be helpful for you to see how it's being done. So for example, this is a class in political science. There's 80 to 100 students in this class. Each uh, class, uh, each seminar has a group of 20. And um, so uh, this is Charles Conte's class. And the way that he, he asks this question, and because his questions are a little bit less um, uh, dialogical, they don't need to have too much debate. It's sort of like, what's your what's your understanding? He wants um, he wants them to see what everybody posts, but he only wants them to see it after they post the first time. So um, there's a setting in forums that lets you check off only see other people's posts after you have posted. So if you, it's something like it's your own perspective, you're not tainted by anybody else's perspective. You just have to write it and post it and then you can read what everybody else has written. So that's one way of designing your forums. And they only, if you're in seminar one, you only see seminar one. So you're only in your small group. So even these large classes, feel like they're small classes because they're moderated in smaller groups and they're having discussions and they're practicing their writing on a frequent basis so that when it comes to write a, a larger piece, they've already been practicing doing this writing. Um, another example is Sociology 1F90. So um, he uses forums for lots of different reasons and for, uh, building community is one of them. So the beginning uh, post is just to practice getting posted, uh, just uh, using forums for the first time. And so this is a, a pretty large class. Uh, I think I wrote two, I wrote 200, but it's actually 240. Um, and so there's an instructor, a course coordinator, teaching assistants, and there's 12 online uh, seminars that are done asynchronously. And uh, the students um, go in and they're, they'll post their, uh, their introduction. This can be done in text. And as I said before, it could be done also as a video or audio. Um, and so this is an example of in the same class, um, actually I wanted to show this page, page first. Every forum has a statistics and grading and it can give you some really great stats. I'm not showing student names here for privacy and of data information, but it can show me all the students, how much they posted, how much they've read, and then I can grade in situ. So this is a particular student's perspective, all of from one student of everything that they've posted all the way through. And then if I clicked on one to see exactly what this person had posted, um, I can see that below there and where it is in the entire thread. So the TA did a really great job of talk of, of framing what's going on this week, what has happened before. Um, if you have any questions, this is the expectation of when I'll respond to you. Um, and then here are the questions that I'd like you to address for this week. And then the students kind of address it in the post. Um, so it's it goes, it's very similar to what would happen in a seminar, except is quite visible about how people participate. Um, and we're finding uh, a lot of people reporting back that students who were typically very quiet and shy in seminar are now really coming um, out of their shell and, and writing a lot. So you're, you're allowing these multiple ways of, of uh, engaging with content. You're not privileging the people who are really confident to talk in a seminar. Um, it is great and very important to have ability to talk and live and present, but it goes back to your learning outcomes. So you can still kind of have this diversity of, of approaches. Um, yeah, so that's the tracking the posts. Another example is this uh, forum for group work accountability. So this was done in uh, an economics course, but it also like um, 
for Julie Stevens uh, sport management course, uh, you it was also when they were saying, okay, well, what, what should we say? What are our points? How are we going to do this? Breaking up the work, that was all done through the forums. And it was very visible for the instructor to see that, make sure that everybody was on track. And so the, the amount of work um, being done in the background was being tracked there. But it's not something that you have to monitor very closely because you're putting the responsibility on the students. And so you do like a, you just say, this is something you have to do. And then you're going to keep track for yourself and you write and you just to submit your um, contributions or reference your contributions in an appendix when you finally submit your final assignment so that the accountability is built in but you don't have to spend all your time tracking and monitoring what people are doing um, i do believe in flexibility in group assignments too i know that often they go off to whatever <laughs> odd format uh, page um, to you know they're using messenger or a group chat or something like to, like that to build but um building this kind of accountability and can uh, alleviate a lot of the stresses of, of group work and design um, a visibility into that so i recommend trying that um uh, and then finally we're going to talk about tests and quizzes a lot of you are interested in high frequency low stakes multiple choice quizzes so i'm just going to talk some about some principles i'm not going to show you all of the click here click here kind of things i'm going to show you what's possible and how to set it up and we are happy to um, take you through when you're ready to start building um, uh, all of the features plus there's links to all of these things that are that live on our help pages um, so when the best best practices around designing assessments is to test for critical thinking, think beyond just yes and no. Um, a one, um, and then you can also randomize the selection and you can draw from question pools and you can time them strategically and also plan for when your assessments are going to happen. And then another great uh, thing to do is to have a practice quiz. So last week I talked about the orientation quiz that I recommend. Um, it serves two purposes. It allows people to practice using the tests and quizzes tool in a low, super low stakes environment. It's only worth like a low amount. You let them take it as not, many times as possible. It ensures that they've read the course outline. You ask things that are very specific to the course outline, but it gives them that experience of using the tests and quizzes tools as you go through it. So I highly recommend that you create um, a, a, an orientation quiz as your first one. Some people do fun ones to, like just to give experience, but that kind of um, exposure to it can really reduce stress when it comes to like a little bit higher stakes questions. Um, Sakai can do lots of different question types. I, 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 most people use just the multiple choice because it can be auto graded. Um, same with the true and false. Um, but there is a short answer and essay ability. There's fill in the blank matching image hotspot. Um, there's some numeric answers and it does uh, take audio as well. Personally, I really recommend just sticking with multiple choice, um, but I do want to let you know that it, there are these wide variety um, of options uh, available. I might pause there for one of my ed tech colleagues to interrupt me and say, no, all the other question types are, are awesome. I, <laughs> I disagree, <laughs> but I find um, for ease of use um, and for what the tool is built for, I think multiple choice is the most robust and best. Um, I, for those of you who recall uh, the great uh, David DiPatista, he, uh, he was um, a faculty associate on multiple choice for uh, the Center for Pedagogical Innovation for a long time. These are some visual notes that I took. I know it's a lot of information. I'll take you through some of the key points here. But um, he did a lot of research on uh, making the most of multiple choice um, um, questions. And so he, um, he had a lot of people give him uh, their uh, exams or multiple choice exams here at Brock University and then he analyzed the questions and responses and came up with some really great uh, best practices that are used around uh, the world now so this was done um, his he published it in 2000 oh it says 2017 it's actually 2008 and this drawing was done like in 2011 um, but it, I see a lot of his stuff uh, everywhere so I'll just take you through some of the key points when you are constructing your multiple choice so the question is the stem these are some of the the terminology so you can know the correct answer is the key the wrong answers are called distractors and what he found is that you actually really only need three distractors um, especially if the last distractor is not possible plausible so what he found is that a lot of people were like you know had no problem coming up with three distractors um, I, and then they were they would be like 
uh, uh, and then they'd write something completely ridiculous, which automatically, you know, that that's not the right answer. I am a fan of the funny last distractor, so I think that's okay. But if it's really clearly wrong, it's not, there's no learning gains. So it's actually better not to, it's better to put less distractors than more. Um, some of the things that he found is that when you write your stem, it should be a full sentence. So it's, there's a, um, often you try and uh, do a like a finish this sentence, complete this sentence kind of activity. Like um, the best way to create a multiple choice question is, and then you have all the answers. The problem with that is twofold. First of all, if you are a second language learner, if English is your second language, you are actually now testing that person's grammar ability versus the, the you know, like how can they complete a sentence versus uh, testing the content. So the recommendation is to write a full sentence and then have and as a question and then have all of your answers uh, below it. Um, ideally, you should make all distractors plausible. Um, ideally, you're using um, distractors that are actually commonly uh, commonly um, common mistakes that your students uh, uh, say or think about a particular topic. And for those of you who've had a lot of experience teaching over many years, you're like, oh, they always think that. So use those as the ones so that you can give that opportunity to give feedback. Um, also, there's the research shows that people often write the right answer correct, and then they have spelling and grammar mistakes in the distractors. And that is a good way to indicate whether it is a right or wrong answer. But again, you're, you're testing for grammar and you're not testing for um, um, for actual content. Of course, unless your uh, topic is grammar, <laughs> then this is completely relevant. So for our language learners, maybe that's that, you know, that like it's a complete the sentence kind of activity. That's a completely different thing than if you're talking about um, you know, the ATP cycle or, 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 any, or some other concept. Um, so yeah, common mistakes make good distractors. Avoid double negatives. You should always write your sentences as a positive because sometimes you're saying, so it's not, 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 not. Um, and then only test a single idea. Julia, I'm sorry, Julia, can I interrupt? Sorry. Yeah. You, you, I don't know if everybody else had you cut out there for a little bit. Could you just repeat that last thing that you just said? Avoiding double negatives. Great. Not, not, not. It's probably because I did too many knots. <laughs> I was like, sorry about that. I'm plugged in. Um, yeah. So when you're uh, constructing your stem sentences and your answers, avoid negatives. Always kind of try and frame it in a positive uh, framework so that it's not, 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 not. Um, and when you're asking questions, only test a single idea. So sometimes you get you sent you say it's this and this. And then you're not actually answering what the question is. Um, and uh, David found that uh, something like, I, I can't remember the percentage, but most of the time, whenever you put all of the above or none of the above, that's the answer. And so that's always a clue that that's going to be the right answer. So if you, it, so you should try and avoid that because it almost is a, a signal to just answer one of those. Um, and the, relatedly is um, the edge avoidance and that can be so people tend not to um, choose a or d in and they always want to go in the middle and when you construct you tend not to do a or d except for when it's all of the and none of the above so we can solve that by randomizing the responses but you have to be careful because if you randomize then all the above is not above anymore so you if you really insist on using all the above you have to say something like all of these or none of these um, when you're constructing. Um, so there, if you wanted to get started on your test construction, you would uh, be surprised to know that the most difficult part is writing the questions, not actually using the technology. So I would recommend that you just start writing in a plain text editor. Um, here's an example of a question where the, um, on the right, and this is the actual format. So it's, it's, you can if you write this all using this format and there's a link to the quick create to show you how to do the format you can import this right into sakai like if you had a hundred questions and you can import it in and it's a little bit faster than just doing question by question if part of you wants to do question by question that's fine it's really it's really simple too but using the the quick create is um is is really simple so that's using something like notepad or text edit you can use word but please save it as text because what you'll notice when you're using word 
and you do a question one, if you try and do this formatting, it wants to um, indent it. And then it's harder to bring that into um, to Sakai. So if you're using a text editor, you can write your questions out uh, beforehand and do hundreds of them. And then you could bring them in and put them in a question pool. And we are happy to help you with that. Please don't be too overburdened about the steps of doing that. Um, but if you wanted to get started on just thinking about the questions, which is the real work, this is the, your subject area. Um, that's where uh, I recommend you start. So overall, in all of this stuff, um, we uh, we want to consider these the design with these things in mind. This article is from uh, um, it's um, a page about trauma informed pedagogy, and I think this particular moment is really important for us to recognize that uh, we are in a, a global pandemic. Although things are opening up, which is great, um, but it's a it's important for us to. Um, keep these elements in mind. I'm going to pause here um, and let Deborah ask a question reminding you that you're going to be recorded for our session, if that's OK. Yes. Um, so I just want to understand in Sakai, if we develop multiple choice questions, and let's say that we use, say, I don't know, we assign 10, mar uh, 10 questions, but we don't want it to be worth 10%. We want it to be worth 2% of the grade. So when you're bringing it into Sakai, I know that I ran into this before and I don't know if it's been corrected, but can I actually set that this test, although there are 10 questions, is only worth 2%? Yeah, yeah, there's no problem. So contact us and we'll show you how to do that. It's, it happens with the way that you insert from the tests and quizzes into the gradebook. So you have to work those in together and use categories and grading um, in your gradebook and then you can make them worth anything. So your test could be worth 37, but you're like, nope, but it's only worth 2%. And that's no problem at all. Um, I won't take you through the steps, but I'm happy to show you individually on how to do that. Yeah, I just want to point out, I'm going to go back a slide because I think Joanne made a great point that I want to uh, bring up about not using all of the above and none of the above. Joanne, do you want to come on and, and tell us? Because I think this is worth re recording. Yeah, thanks, Julia. So uh, when we did um, research, we had the multiple choice questions and whenever there was a none of the above we put a text box beside it uh, in case and we told the students if you pick none of the above you get a bonus mark if you write in this box what you believe the answer is and in the vast majority of cases they it was clear that they did not actually know what the answer was they just knew that none of the options were the answer, but they were getting full marks for that. Such a great point. And then what kind of learning is happening there, right? Thank you. You should be doing this session. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. You're awesome. <laughs> um, so, and Can I just interrupt for a second to yeah. clarify what she just said? Because one of my favorite things is none of the above the answer is. Can I make like, can, she said it was extra credit. Can I make that the credit? If you build it into the question, but if it, it's none of the above, the answer is, then why wouldn't you just put the answer? Well, because I want to see if they can, like what I've done, I don't want them to have the chance to get the right answer accidentally. Right, yes. So what I would recommend for you is to do, well, there's two ways you could do it. You could probably say none of the above, give the rationale, which is what Joanne's suggesting, and that's a that's a feature. You can force um, a rationale that they have to write, but or you could say none of the above, and then you could give feedback to them on on why. But if you build it into the question, um, I'm not sure that I, I you could do like if you're doing multiple select, you could probably say which of these are correct. And then if it is none of the above, the answer is this. That would be a best way to do that because um, typically, when it's none of the above, that's the answer. Does that make sense? Uh, yeah, I think so. I, I would have to consult with you, I guess, on exactly how to design what I want to do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe Joanne can explain it better because she's popping in. Please, Joanne, go ahead. Um, actually, it's uh, all of the above is typically the answer. So we found that whenever all of the above was an option, that was the one that was the correct answer. So instructors used uh, all of the above 
as the answer in an unequal amount of questions. So if you are going to use all of the above, just make sure that it is the key or the answer the same amount of times as any of your other options would be. And then the issue with the none of the above was that they don't actually know the the answer. Uh, OK, thank you for clarifying. And yes, we can work through the, the construction with you. Linda. thank you. Is there another hand up or is the same Joanne? OK. Um, so I just wanted to go through these points and talk about a little bit about the structure. So what really happened, what is great if you're going to be using any of these assessments to build this predictability so that if you need them to post or if they have to fill out a quiz, kind of do it on a consistent schedule um, to show that and then um, but also allow a little bit of flexibility because we are in this uh, this global pandemic, as I was saying, there's a lot going on with some people. So try and build in flexibility right from the beginning um, and then use the time um, that you are going to be doing um, connect to, for connection to make sure that they can also connect with each other. Um, and so those are all the elements there. I just wanted to point out how essential our teaching assistants are going to be in this process um, and that CPI is offering support uh, to them all through the summer. If they are incoming grad students and they have, uh, as long as they have a student ID, they can get into the Sakai site. If they, if we're doing anything synchronous, they, they're welcome to join if they don't have their ID yet, but otherwise um, everything's in Sakai and you do need to have um, a Brock campus ID to get into Sakai, but please um, have them connect with us. Um, I did want to point out that these instructional support assistant positions, uh, we're accepting applications. There's going to be two per faculty and they're going to be working on facilitating uh, TAs and helping with all of these big questions of how to do this engagement really well. Um, so um, just to let you be aware of that. Hi, Michael, I see your hand up. Yes, um, it was something you just said remind me of a question I have. Uh, the advice I've been reading and hearing for online assessments with regards to accessibility is to provide lots of flexibility in terms of timing and such. But the advice I've been seeing and hearing about integrity has suggested no, you should put a very tight time limit. Uh, like if you have a 30 minute quiz, it should be this 30 minute block of the day. Yeah. The yeah. Likelihood of uh, collaboration. I know. Any I'm, yeah. Advice? Well, you know, I'm you're you're talking to somebody who believes in that collaboration improves learning, um, and that multiple like so. I would prefer that you uh, b go for flexibility first versus strict timelines. I know a lot of people do timelines, and that's a kind of a requirement um, for them for them. But if you were to ask my personal advice, I would rather you built in flexibility and that you designed it so that collaboration actually improved it. So if it was, um, so I know with the multiple choice questions like. That's why randomizing the answers, randomizing the questions that come to you. And I know that you've done a lot of this stuff already. Like you actually had a really innovative, uh, I, I, after I stop recording, I want to find out how your, um, your random uh, assignment went um, uh, last term. But um, I, I'm, I think that we need to build in flexibility. There's going to be students who do need to have some accommodation and it's going to go beyond learning accommodations because we need people who with internet accommodations and lack of uh, space accommodations. Um, but yes, all, a lot of the advice is to use time wisely um, as far as um, constricting it. But personally, I prefer to open that up um, and get to the core of what you're trying to assess. OK, thanks. Um, so last week uh, we, we voted and that's what how we chose. So now it's time to have a runoff vote for what's left. Um, I'm using a different method this time. I wanted to share um, a different way of getting some informal feedback. Um, so I'm asking you to go vote on what set what you would like uh, us to cover next session. So I've just I've removed all of the things that we talked about this week and this is what's left. Feel free. Oh, I don't think I left a 
a full answer. So, but I did ask a start, stop, continue. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to model what a formative feedback tool could look like using forms that you could be doing with your students to kind of make sure that you're on track. But also, I do really appreciate your feedback. Uh, the people have reached out to me to let me know things I've been trying to tweak as we go. So that's this is the shape taking the shape of this session based on all the feedback I've gotten over the last two months. Um, so please let me know what you want us to start doing. What would you like us to stop doing? Uh, start, stop, and then what would you like us to continue doing? Um, and with that, I'm going to stop recording and then I'm happy to open it up. I see some hands um, being raised, so I really want to 